everybody, I'm Laura Simpson, I'm the Programme Manager here at Hospital Field. Welcome to our HARP celebration event, which starts with a talk by Simon Chadwick. And if you haven't noticed, we're running Hospital Field Summer Festival. It's our inaugural festival. And this celebration is our fourth in the in the list, which you see in this little leaflet, but actually it's really not our fourth because we've had a whole series of events this week as part of our summer school, which sort of multiplies that by, by three. We've had a cohort of 70 people here um, hearing international speakers during Wednesday, Thursday and Friday running up to this event. Um, and I hope you might be able to come to some of our events over the next few weekends, which are in here, starting with next weekend, our Beer and Berries event, which is a food-focused event um, with other Angus food producers on Saturday. And then it... Uh, and then Open Gardens. And with, and with Scot Scotland's Garden Scheme. So for the whole of the afternoon, we're going to have other producers here and we're going to be running a cafe and then between two and five, the walled gardens open as part of Scotland's garden scheme. And then the final events on the 15th, which is a music event in the evening of that Saturday. So if I could introduce Simon Chadwick, he's a scholar and musician based in St Andrews, which he uses as a base for his own research into harps and harp playing, but also he teaches at the University of St Andrews as well. And it's been really interesting to speaking to Simon about what he's going to talk about in response to knowing about our error we should have heart being restored. Um, I thought it was very interesting how he focuses on the techniques but also the, the people and the music. So it's a really holistic idea of thinking about the, the culture associated with these instruments. And also another layer which I think is relevant to this house and to the Alan Frasers is um, an emphasis on how medievalism influenced the interest in harps um, for Victor the Victorians. So I think that there are some of the things that are going to be touched on in Simon's talk. So welcome Simon, thank you very much. <laughs> this talk. I'm, I'm a harpist and a musician and I'm interested in historical harps and this was a bit scary for me because this is far too modern compared with most of the stuff that I do. But actually this just this year I've been creeping more and more into the 19th century stuff and, I, and I'm currently working on a, a programme I'm going to do at the museum in St Andrews in two weeks time which is, the, the, the museum has an exhibition of the Victorian rediscovery of the medieval town. And so I'm going to play medieval tunes in sort of Victorian harp style. And so, and so suddenly seeing this instrument connected in with a lot of my current research and interests. So, so what I'm going to t talk about this evening is a little bit about this type of harp, how it was seen and used and heard in early to mid 19th century Scotland. And then to give you a, a, a wider and deeper context, we'll have a quick rattle through the history of the harp in Scotland from <coughs> ancient times up until 20th century. So, so we have a, a focused look at this harp and its milieu and its broad context. So people, people talk about this, this harp and they say it's, a, it's an Erard Grecian pedal harp. And people who talk about harps, like other musical instruments, they love these piling up technical terms to describe what the instrument is. Um, so it's Erard because Sebastian Erard was this French inventor and musical instrument maker who set up a whole factory. He had workshops in London and in Paris making... Um, I think they started with pianos, but harps were their big thing. And he was an inventor. And in the late 18th and early 19th century, it was a great period of invention. That you, you would, any musical instrument that you could think of, how do you make it better? How do you make it bigger, louder, with more strings, with more chromatic capability? All the instruments were doing it. Trumpet makers were adding valves and things, and piano makers were inventing new kinds of mechanism, new kinds of keyboard action. And so in the world of harps, 
The, the way a harp works, if, if you know music at all, it's, it's like the white notes of a piano. Okay? Each string is like one of the white keys of a piano. And this is fine until you want to change key or play sharps and flats. And so there's a an late 17th century, early 18th century German thing where you have a little twiggling thing that frets the string at the top and lifts it by a semitone. And, and, and that's all very well and good. And then at some point, some clever German inventor thought, well, if you tie a piece of string to all the twiggling things, you could pull them all at once and do like all the Fs to F sharp all in one go. And, and so this kind of caught on and developed. But the, the early systems were very crude and didn't have a huge effect on the heart world. And there was a social thing. So Marie Antoinette came to the French court from the Hasburg court in 1773 and she was a harpist on this new kind of chromatic harp and so that's when it became fashionable so it became part of the whole French court scene to play these big pedal harps except they didn't work that well and so the inventors were always looking for new systems and so Erard patented this system that has a little a little turning disc with prongs on. And you can come and look at the half afterwards. This has these. There's these little circular discs, and each disc has two prongs. And so the, and so the prongs go, go like this over the string. And when you press the mechanism, the disc turns and pinches the string. And that shortens it and makes it sound a semitone higher. So you press your pedal, you press the F pedal, and all the F strings go and turn to F sharp. This is very magic. And so this is Erard's great thing, and he, he patented this system in 1794. And that kind of harp is called a single action ram's head harp. And it's called single action because it has one row of it has one row of the little fork discs, so it can sh it can change from natural to sharp every string. And it's called ram's heads because it has ram's heads on the front here. And for some reason, every time they invented a new mechanism, they changed the design. And all the other makers would, would kind of try and copy the ideas. And even if you patent it, you can, you can go to a different country and make rip-offs, basically. <laughs> so Erard wasn't, wasn't happy to rest in his laurels. It's all very well having invented this thing. He wanted to keep inventing. He wanted to keep having new models to sell to people to upgrade. So this was his next major invention, and this was a patent from 1810, when he invented the idea that instead of having one row of these things to change from natural to sharp, you have two rows. So you can have you can have the strings. You tune all the strings flat, and then you can press the pedal once, and it and it tracks it the first time and makes the string natural, and you press it again and it tracks the second one and makes it sharp. So this is a very clever idea. And it suddenly means you can play every key, you can have all the sharps, all the flats, you can do whatever key changes you want. Okay? And it makes the harp a much more versatile musical instrument for that kind of classical music. So in 1810, he patented this new mechanism, and he changed the design, and he has it with these, with these um, figures on them. And they're, and they're a Greek figure, which you all know more than, more than I, are they called cataryds? Is that right? Some Greek architectural person helped me. <laughs> there, was a, there was a great fashion for, for Greek styles. Marie Antoinette's art would have, would have been very French Baroque in its style, but these Greek styles were much more popular, especially in England. So, th so this gives us the context. This is the latest thing in 1810, and this model carried on for a little while. Um, Erard's final great innovation was to basically beef the harp up massively. So it adds more strings, makes it much stronger, makes it louder, the strings are thicker, it has a lot more volume. And this, and this is called the Gothic harp, and he patented that in 1836. And the, and the Gothic harp, I guess, is, is the type that kind of sets the standard that carries on to the present day. I mean, there, there carries on being improvements to... The improvements of the harps get bigger and they get louder and the, and the mechanism is refined subtly, but the Gothic harp is like, it's like it, it, it becomes a stable design that carries on. So, so our harp here is a little bit old-fashioned by that standards, mm -hmm. and, and yet it still has that 
complete chromatic capability. Okay. So what kind of scene was there that would have led Elizabeth to have gotten this harp in about 1830? Well, these kind of big pedal harps were fairly popular in Scotland in, in a well-to-do aristocratic scene. This lovely portrait by Rayburn of the, <coughs> of the um, Marchioness of Northampton, Margaret Maclean Clefane. She's from a Mull family, um, and she and her sisters played the harp and the piano, and they were highly educated and literate, and they were also Gaelic speakers, and they were interested in collecting their old music. And I think they saw a connection between collecting old Gaelic music and having a harp to play it on. Now, at this time, there, there, there was no indigenous harp tradition. It had died out long before. And so the obvious way to get a harp is to send to London, and Mr. Erard would deliver you a harp. And it's, the painting's very dark, so you can't really see what's going on. I think, this is a, I think she's got a single-action harp. I think you can see there's only one row of fork discs along the top. So her harp is lighter and more delicate than our one here. But it's the same basic idea. And so she would have used the harp like this to play classical music, to play her, to play her own arrangements of Gaelic song airs, to sing and to play the harp with her accompaniment as a domestic thing for, for the entertainment of herself and her sisters and her family and visitors to the house. This is the kind of scene that these harps were used in. She's very interesting because she has a connection to Sir Walter Scott. Uh, her father died when she was quite young, and Walter Scott became her legal guardian for her and her sisters, and they travelled to Abbotsford a lot. And I think that, that she and her sister fed Watty a lot of the background information that he used in his novels. So, so, so she, she, she passes on traditions and stories from the Highlands that, that give a lot of the Highland flavour in the novels. This is the Chinese drawing room in Abbotsford, and on the right is Sophia Lockhart's harp. She was Walter Scott's daughter. I don't actually know what this harp on the left is. It wasn't in the catalogue when, when I visited Abbotsford, and it's just not mentioned. So, I, I, I didn't used to be in the house, so I don't know where they've got it from or why it's there, but never mind. This, is, this, one, is, this one is Sophia's harp. It's an um, Erard Grecian harp, almost exactly the same as our one here. I thought was rather nice. Um, <clears throat> it's not restored, it doesn't have any strings on, so it just sits there, poor and silent, but it's still lovely to see. And Sophia, Sophia wrote in a letter, Papa has got us a most delightful new heart from London the other day. It and the stand for the books cost £119, so you may think that it is a very handsome thing. This is in 1817. And, and so we have references from the family papers and letters about her music. She, she would sing Scots songs and ballads. So they were interested in traditional music and in trying to revive the ballad tradition, the Scots song tradition. And so she, Sophia, Sophia would play the harp and sing these ballads. And Walter Scott loved her to hear her sing, and he was very proud of her skill on the harp. But her sister Anne said, Sophia is rather too much with her harp. I wish she would take example of old times and hang it up. <laughs> so you can also imagine this, God, she's playing the harp again. Save us all. This is just a close-up of the mechanism on Sophia's harp. This is just so you can see the, the discs with the forks on and the rods that connect them so that they turn in sync but out of sync, if you see what I mean. And Sebastian Erard's patent number and name and the royal crest. And Sophia's has a different decorative scheme to our one here. So, so 
keep your back one. You can see it's got the same figures with wings. So, so all these, these gesso mouldings are all the same. They're made in moulds and stuck on and gilded. But the paintwork, so you can see it's lacquered and then it has these gilded painted lines running along the top. Just like our one here. And I was just looking at this beading, but the beading is gesso and lacquered, so that's the same. Well, it's not quite the same, but it's a different, a different mould. But the painting, especially on the soundboard, you could have just about any design you wanted to. I think that, the, that, the, that you could, you, when you ordered your half, you would, you would order what colour you wanted it, and they would lacquer it custom to you. And I've seen other halves that have these kind of Greek figures on it. It fits in with that Grecian theme, and the muses, and that whole cultural idea. They're very aesthetic instruments. They, you know, the, the, the visual aspect of these harps is, is very important. So, another one that, I, that, that is very interesting is Elizabeth Grant of Rothimerchus. And she describes in 1812 about when they were young in, uh, up in Speyside, about, their, about their ex her experience with her sisters of playing the harp. She says, Our clothes were all laid on a chair overnight in readiness for being taken up in proper order. My mother would not give us candles, and Miss Elphick, the governess, insisted we should get up. We were not allowed hot water. And really, in the Highland winters, when the breath froze on the sheets and the water in the jugs became cakes of ice, washing was a cruel necessity. The fingers were pinched enough. As we could play our scales well in the dark, the two pianos and the harp began the day's work. How very near crying was the one whose turn set her at the harp, I will not speak of. The strings cut the poor cold fingers, so that the blisters often bled. Marta the first sat decidedly in the dining room at the harp. Marta the second put her poor blue hands on the keys of the grand pianoforte in the drawing room. For in those two rooms the fires were never lighted till near nine o'clock. The grates were of bright steel, the household was not early, and so we had to bear our hard fate. So sometimes I think it could be a tyranny, this, this, this domestic music, you will be good at playing the harp, you will entertain the household guests, but you don't have to enjoy it. <laughs> this is, um, this is the, the book of harp music published by Mr. Eloy, and this is, this is a copy that's in Dundee Library, and it was given to the Whiten Collection by an, um, uh, a man who's fairly close to here. An, an Angus man who had it in his family. And so I wondered if, for a second if there was any connection with the harp here, but I don't think so. But um, Eloi was a very interesting man. He came to Edinburgh. He was in Edinburgh at least as early as 1807. Um, he had to leave Edinburgh. We don't know whether he left or died in 1821. So he was in Edinburgh at that time when this, these harps were becoming fashionable. And he taught the harp, and he published these, this, these books of Scots songs. So it, again, this ties into what Sophia Lockhart was playing. Um, that, that, that there's an interest in the harp as a kind of minstrel instrument um, that is connected to Scots minstrel, probably, the, the broader songs, the Scots songs. And um, some of these songs are quite racy. I'm not sure they're at all appropriate for young ladies, you know, these, these, these traditional Scots songs about men chasing women and trying to get them and this kind of thing. It's not decent. <laughs> and yet it's presented, you know, dedicated to the Earl of Eglinton and you can tell the kind of social scene that he's moving in. Um, Elizabeth Grant went to Elo the, the harp class that Eloi organised. She said, Monsieur Eloi, the harp master, charged so much for his private lessons that my mother suggested to him to follow the Edinburgh fashion of classes at so much a quarter, three lessons a week. He made quite a fortune. There were eight pupils in a class, the lesson lasting two hours. We three, that's her and her sisters, the two hunters, Grace Stein, afterwards Lady Don, Amelia Giglio, and Catherine Inglis were his best scholars. We played concerted pieces, doubling the parts. Choruses arranged by him and sometimes duets or solos practising in other rooms. 
the fame of our execution spread over the town, and many persons entreated permission to mount up the long common stair to the poor Frenchman's garret to listen to such a number of harps played by such handsome girls. One or two of the mamas would have had no objection, but my mother and Lady Hunter would not hear of their daughters being part of an exhibition. We were there to learn, not to show off. Miss Elphick, the governess, too, had her own ideas upon the subject. She always went with us and was extremely annoyed by the group of young men so frequently happening to pass down the street just at the time our class dispersed. <laughs> Some of them are dancing partners, so that there were bows and speeches and attendance home, much to her disgust. She waited once or twice till the second class assembled, but the bow waited too. So then she carried us all off a quarter of an hour too soon, leaving our five companions to their fate. And this not answering long, she set to scold Musha Elwa and called the gen Edinburgh gentleman all sorts of names. In the midst of her season of wrath, the door of our music room opened one day, and a large, fine-looking military man, braided and belted and moustached, entered and was invited to be seated. Every harp was silent. Mesdemoiselles, said Monsieur Elwa, with his most polished air of command, recommence, if you please. This gentleman is my most particular friend, a musical amateur, etc. Miss Elphick was all in a flame. Up she rose, and she made us rise, gather our music together, and driving us and Amelia Giglio before her, we were shawled and bonneted in less time than I am writing of it, and on our way downstairs, before poor Monsieur had finished his apologies to the officer and the other young ladies, never was little woman in such a fury. We never returned to the harp classes, and neither did the hunters, and very soon they were given up. <laughs> so just imagine, this is exactly the kind of harp that they were sitting at, all these girls in this room with, with Musha Elwa and his, and his fine military friends, going to, going to ogle the young ladies. But you can see that kind of domestic, aristocratic setting, that it was absolutely not on for anyone to come in and listen to the girls play the harp. It was, it was for their own improvement and for their domestic performance. <clears throat> okay. Does anyone have any questions about this aspect of our story? before we move on to the general history of the harp. We can, we can take more questions at the end if you want. Yes? Just one, how, is it easy to learn on the piano? I mean, or is it Yes, it's, it's, it's not as easy as the piano, right. but it's not impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so so this, this, this kind of harp is designed for these amateur aristocratic ladies to be able to play. This is, this is, this is its thing. Think of Marie Antoinette, but it becomes fashionable, and everybody has to have one. And so the system of the way the harp is set up, the strings are colour-coded so that you can identify the notes. You're, you're playing from a book like from um, Michel Elwaz in his book of Scott's songs, and you've got the system of changing key and pressing the pedals. So, so it's designed to be as accessible as a piano. And I think for a while, no, people weren't sure which would be the most universal musical instrument, the piano or the harp. And partly there was a little bit of a race between the inventors. So piano inventors would invent a new action that would make the piano sound better, be easier to play. And then the harp makers would invent a new mechanism that allowed you to have more sharps and flats. And so they were like, which way is it going to go? And in the end, the piano won. <laughs> what point does the harp appear with a degree of regularity in orchestral work? Or well, I'm not sure. It's in the middle of the 19th century, what would you yeah, say? Yeah, probably be more um, sort of Debussy and um, the, the harp is not really orchestral until sort of romantic, romantic period. So like Berlioz, Debussy. So what kind of date would we be more, talking? More Latin. What uh, kind of date? 1850s. Yeah, I was going to say 1850s, 60s. Yeah. So, so uh, especially after the event, after the patenting of the Gothic harp, mm. which is bigger and more powerful than this instrument. It would have been more the Gothic. Because if, if you're going to use a, a harp in an orchestra, it has to be loud, you know? It's, it's, it's competing with all the violins and everything. And so, and so I think this instrument, its, it's voice is too 
subtle and delicate and domestic to really stand hold his own in an orchestra. And that's been, since the invention of the Gothic harp, that's been the trajectory of harp improvements to make them bigger, louder, you know. So, so modern harps are significantly bigger and significantly more powerful, they use more force to play the strings, and they're really quite loud. You know, you can easily fill a big concert hall and be heard over the strings. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk, let's, talk, let's talk completely generally about the harp or harps, because there's not just one type of harp. This is one of the things that's interesting about harps, is that it's, there's a kind of category thing going on. You, you can talk about the piano. Okay? And you play you know what a piano is, you know how it's set up. Anybody who can play the piano can, play, can get to any piano and play it. But the harp is not like that. Every culture and country and people in the world has a harp, because, because a harp is like a kind of general category of instruments. All, all that it means to have a harp is that the strings are open on both sides and pulling away from the same box. Okay? So every culture in the world has invented harps independently, and all these different harps are completely different from each other, and nothing translates across. Okay? If, you, if you can play this kind of harp, you're not going to go very far with an African harp with only six strings that you hold back the front. And you don't even know what scale it's tuned to. And there are Chinese harps, and there are Asian harps, and there are, I'm not sure if there's harps in, in the Americas, but just about every culture in the world has invented this idea that you get in a box and you stretch the strings away from it. Okay. Now, in, in Ireland and Scotland, in the old Gaelic world, is, there was a type of harp that is kind of separate from the rest of Europe. And this is there's an interesting story about the harp in Scotland, is that you have these two quasi-independent traditions, the old Gaelic traditions of Ireland and Scotland and the kind of Anglo-continental traditions. And this harp is very much part of the Anglo-continental traditions. It's a natural development. Like I say, it comes out of the German innovations, passed through the French course, made in London. Okay. But the, the, the Scottish and Irish Gaelic traditions are quite independent all the way back. And it's a really interesting thing how they kind of come together in the 18th and 19th century and bounce off each other. So this is where we'll start, as, as far back as you can go. These are three broken, fragmentary stone cross slabs from, from not that far away from here. The, the one on the left used to be in Monifeith churchyard, but they've just taken away to Edinburgh now. I was so embarrassed, I thought, oh, I must go to Monifeith and find the cross. And I went down the hundred around the church. I not find it. That very foolish when I realise it's in the museum. The one, the one in the middle is in Brechin Cathedral, but it originally comes from Aldbar Church, and the one on the right is in Lathendi House. It's built in as a lintel into the house, and nobody knows where it came from. And you can see that each of them, th these are all um, these are all high crosses, so these are biblical scenes illustrating scenes from the Old Testament. And they're kind of cartoon style. And so when you want to show King David, you show a man sitting down with a triangular thing in front of him. Trying to get a stripy thing, that's King David. Okay? And this one here, this is King David. And, and in this one, he's wrestling with the lion, because this is the other way you show King David, so you make him wrestle with the lion. And there's his sheep, and there's his harp, because you can't, you can't play the harp and wrestle with the lion at the same time. <laughs> and then this one, this is a more mysterious scene, because we've got a man here playing pipes, and there's a square thing, some people say it's a drum, some people say it's a box. It's just a square thing, and there's an animal, and then there's the triangular stripy thing. And then these are ecclesiasticals with books, and these are ecclesiasticals with books, and so are these. These ones have got crosses, and these ones have got horns of some kind. So, so, so in, in Pictish times, you get these pictures of, of figures with triangular stripy things in context that makes you think King David, stringed instruments. But there's nothing you can say more than that. You can't even say if this is a reflection of Pictish musical practice or if the stone carvers had a um, Byzantine gospel book that had instruments like this that they copied with no idea of what they were doing. You, there's not much you can say except there they are. The, the oldest harps that we have from this part of the world are these two 
which are not really dated very well. Nobody really knows how old they are. The one on the left is in Trinity College in Dublin, and it's traditionally said to have belonged to Brian Baru, who was High King of Ireland in the 12th, in the 11th and 12th centuries. But nobody really thinks it's that old, but nobody really knows. And the one on the right is called Queen Mary's Harp, and it lives in the museum in Edinburgh. But everybody thinks it's much older than the time of Mary, Queen of Scots. It was an antique when she had it, if she ever did. Um, the, the artwork on the Queen Mary Harp gives it a kind of 15th century Iona provenance. This is my archaeological replica of it, so that you can see in more detail the artwork and the designs on it. And it's these kind of swirling leaves. These match stone carvings in Iona and on the Isles from the later 15th century. So this gives you an idea of what the medieval harp traditions were like. These fit into that Gallic world of the lords and chieftains in their courts and the patronage of the high status bardic poems writing very, very complex, subtle, syllabic praise poetry which would be recited with the accompaniment of harps. And the, this kind of harp is a completely different, completely different concept of how a musical instrument works from the Erard harp. It's triangular and it has strings down the middle, but that's kind of as far as it goes. So the strings on this harp are made of silver and brass wire to give it a kind of... medieval harp traditions. We don't have any bits of music for this instrument. You know, we have the instrument in the museum, so you can, you can make an archaeological replica, you can get it set up. But there's no notation to tell you how to play or what to play on it. And so that's a whole separate... This is, a lot of my work is to try and recreate how to play this instrument, what to play on it. And it, and it gets very speculative, but you also get certain, a certain sort of ethnomusicological path you can travel down to get there. So... It's, it's, an, it's an interesting lost world, these medieval harp traditions. You, you, you get other harp things in Scotland, so, so you get these 17th century carvings, like the one on the left with the mermaid. And you wonder what's the symbolism here, what's, what's going on? There's, there starts to get a connection between the harp and the poetry because of its use for the accompaniment of this very high status bardic praise poem, poetry. But I don't really understand the harp and the mermaid. This, this appears in a few other places. The Lamont harp on the right is another ancient harp that survives in Scotland. It's, a, it's also in the museum in Edinburgh. Um, it, has a, it has a traditional story that gives it a Perthshire provenance and originally um, um, South Argyle provenance. But nobody really knows how old it is. Um, one day they'll be carbon dated and we'll, have, we'll be able to tell you how old they are and when they were made. But nobody really knows. This, the Lamont harp could be 17th century, it could be 14th century, nobody really knows. It's, it's very frustrating if you, try and, if you try and tell a history and you've got these amazing objects and you just can't even put them in order. The, um, the old native harp traditions in Scotland were, I would say they were in decline from perhaps the 15th century onward. The 15th century was perhaps the high point. Think of the Lords of the Isles, the great Gallic chieftains of the West, and they're, they're, they were at the height of their political and economic and cultural power. And over time, there was more and more influence from Edinburgh, from the Anglo South, and the Gallic world kind of shrunk and lost its loss of its wealth. And because these harps were part of that high-status Gallic world, they would decline because there wasn't the money to pay professionals to pay for instruments. And so the last of the old Gallic harp tradition, people in Scotland were in the right, 1700, there were still some alive. By 1750, they're pretty much all gone. It's surprisingly early that a big tradition like this dies out. In Ireland, you've got the same pressures, you've got the same colonial pressures trying to, you know, de the decline of the old Gallic orders and the replacement with Anglo-continental models. But in Ireland, the harp tradition carries on a little bit longer. 
And so in the, through the 18th century, there's still a, a vibrant harp tradition, native Gallic harp tradition in Ireland. This man on the left is um, one of the last of the old Irish harp, it was all through the 18th century. He, he toured in Scotland, he came to Scotland because there was still, even though there weren't native harpers in Scotland, there was still a market for the old Gallic harp music. So he was at Hollywood House in 1745 and played for the Prince. And he toured, I suppose, the Central Highlands as well. I, I don't know that he came out this far out, but I, I just don't know. And this is his, his harp on the right. And this is my, this is my harp mentor, Anne Hayman, who told me a lot of what I know, demonstrating it. This is another Irish harper who toured Scotland. This is Patrick Byrne. He, he was, after the, after the last old tradition bearer in Ireland died, perhaps about 1800, they tried to keep it going. They, they, they engaged the, the very last old man to teach in a charitable school. And Patrick Byrne was a second generation scholar of the school. So it's already passed into the hands of revivalists who are actively trying to keep it going. It's not a thriving native tradition anymore. But he, he was a very successful performer. He played for Queen Victoria and Prince Albert. And he was in Edinburgh in 1845. And it was the Waverley Ball. And they organized a tableau vivant, different, different scenes from Walter Scott's novels dressed, you know, presented by live actors. And Patrick Byrne was set up and dressed up as the last minstrel, striking the last lay on his harp. And, and then um, the photographers Hill and Adamson whisked him off to their studio on Carlton Hill and took this amazing picture, a photograph of him. Um, there's... It's really interesting, this, this image, because it brings together so many of these different cultural strands. So, so he, was being, he was playing his harp. Actually, we don't even know if he was playing his harp at the ball, but he was certainly playing his harp for society events in Edinburgh and also further south in England. At the same time that our uh, Erard harp was here in plays and that Walter Scott's daughter was playing, that, that whole scene I talked about earlier. And yet he's come out of a completely different world. His harp has metal strings, is played on the left side, which is the old Irish and Scottish and Welsh way. And he's learnt, he's blind, and he's learnt in an oral tradition from harpists whose masters went, go back in an unbroken lineage, right back to medieval times. So, so, so he's the living embodiment of the old indigenous tradition that has nothing to do with the fashionable pedal harps coming up from London. He's, he's being presented as the last minstrel. And of course, the lay of the last minstrel is all about border minstrelsy, the Scots songs, the Anglo-Scottish border ballads, which is nothing to do with his actual music tradition. He's Irish harper working in the old Gaelic tradition with an Irish point of view. And yet, this idea of the, the, the old harper being a border ballad singer plugs right into what we talked about, Sophia singing her Scots songs, and Eloi publishing the Scots songs. And the third interesting strand is that the composition and framing and costume of this picture plugs us into a whole tradition of illustrating Ossian and the poems of Ossian, the semi-ancient, semi-made-up, old Gaelic heroic epics from Ireland and from the highlands of Scotland. So there's this complete kind of mismatch of these three things, these three cultural strands coming together with a crunch in the middle. This is the, this is the result of it. So, Patrick Byrne was one of the last of the old harpers. And at the same time, we have this swelling of interest in the, in the new double action harp and people would order them up from London and they would play the Scots songs and classical music. I think there was a bit of a decline of this kind of harp music in Scotland after the mid-19th century. I think, it, I think there was less harp playing in Scotland after 1850 than before 1850. And I'm not entirely sure why. 
I've seen the same thing in Ireland, that there was a, there was a big excitement about harp music in the early 19th century, and it kind of died away in the late 19th century. So, for example, um, after Eloi left Edinburgh, the, the main harp teacher was Henry Edward Dibden, and he was around from 1833 to 1771. But most of his activity was in the earlier part of that time, and after he vanished from the scene in 71, there doesn't seem to be you know, there's, there's, there's not much going on at that, at that time in Edinburgh, and there's not much interest in harps in general in Scotland. And so, in 1890, when all the movers and shakers in Highland culture got together in Oban and, and decided that they would organise an annual festival of Gaelic arts, the Mott, there wasn't really a harp scene at all, and yet they knew that the harp was a really important part of the old Gaelic world, and yet they had no way to access the old native tradition because it had been dead and gone for, for centuries almost. And so what happened was that there was a kind of new revival of harping in Scotland that starts very precisely in 1891 or 1892. And this is, and this is what happens. Okay? In, the, in the 1890s, they know that there is an ancient Scottish harp tradition. They've seen, this, they've seen the original of this in the museum. They know what it looks like. They know it's little. They know it's decorated. They know it's kind of square and stout. And yet they have no access to the tradition that produced it. What they do have access to is London harp makers, the successors of Erard producing double action pedal harps. And so, um, and so the London harp makers kind of design a cut down version of this thing so that it looks ancient. So it's played in pedal harp style. It, it's, it, has, it even has mechanisms to allow you to change key and to get sharps and flats, although the mechanisms are not connected to pedals. They're completely finger operated. You just, you just turn it at the top of your fingers. And this, this, was, this was very successful. It's like a kind of cheap, lightweight, portable, simplified version of the pedal harp. And these caught on, and with some ups and downs since, this is still going strong. And this is, this is what we know as the classic today. It come, comes out of this revival from the 1890s. Okay. So, so, so this, these innovations produce yet another strand to the to the story of harps in Scotland. That's me, unless we have any questions, or is there anything that you want me to repeat, or is there anything that I've missed? But it seemed to be very expensive, and I wonder whether the piano became a little bit easier to get hold of. I don't know, pianos are very expensive. Mm -hmm. If you send to a Piano maker. Do you, do you think halves are more expensive than pianos? I, think, I think the intricacies of the, the discs and all the mechanisms that are involved, you know, I'm not saying that the piano yeah. doesn't, but the piano is a little bit maybe more basic than that front. That it's just I think piano. pianos are sturdier, aren't they? I mean, yes. You can have a piano and you can leave it kicking around the living room. You know, we, they've created really from sort of iron and yeah. something, you know, to be honest, but I think the amount of in this, inside the neck of the harp, the mechanisms are so intricate, it's, it's unbelievable. It's, and it's all through the, the pillar as well that there's rocks, Well, you can look, you can, you, you, can, you can see the mechanism up inside here. So I, think, I think that was much more difficult to, to mass produce, and that's why there isn't as many harps. Yeah. I, think, I think there's lots of reasons why pianos took over from harps. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if cost is one of them. You'd have to ask somebody who knew more about it. 19th century economics. <laughs> yes? Um, historically, who is uh, the harp associated more with women and men? Oh, yeah, I never talked about women and men, but it's, but it's an important <laughs> issue. So, in the, old, in the old Scottish and Irish tradition, the harp was very much a man's instrument because it was a high status professional thing. And, and if you go back to medieval times, then anything high status and professional is by definition man's stuff. Mm -hmm. so, 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 all, so, so, so you have these great lords in their castles who are all men, and you have these noble poets composing great Slavic verse who are all men, and, this, and, the, and the verses are sung by singers who are all men, and the singers are accompanied by harpists who are all men, and women basically don't get a look in. OK? 
Okay? And, and the fascinating thing about the harp is that the, the Anglo-Continental tradition, after Marie Antoinette basically kick-started the whole idea of being interested in playing the harp, is almost entirely a woman's thing. It's very unusual to get men playing the harp in that context. The one, the one place you get men playing the harp, play, playing the pedal harp, is as teachers, like Monsieur Eloir. And so this is, a, this is a very typical dynamic, that the young ladies are learning the harp. They're the people who are, who are the harpists, but their teacher is a man. And the harp makers are men as well. And so, so I'm, all, I'm always interested in this dynamic that you get you get men making it, supplying it, teaching it, and it's the ladies that get to do it. Um, it and I think that the reason for that, part of the reason for that is connected to this whole domestic thing. You know, that the harp is seen as a domestic instrument. Like I said, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really go into the orchestra until the later 19th century, and by, the, by that time it's already become fixed as a ladies' instrument. <coughs> wasn't, wasn't there an anecdote? Was it one of the Vienna orchestras? <coughs> And, and, it, and, it, and, and this orchestra was strictly men only for a long time, right up to the 20th century, except for the harpists was allowed to be a woman, because there were no men harpists, and, and they'd have shot themselves in the foot if they'd have really been men only. But, it, but it's fascinating, the whole gender, the whole gender issues with the harp, it's, it's one of the most gendered instruments in either direction at different times in its history. And I don't really know why that is. I think, it's con I, think it's, I think this is connected to harps and more than musical instruments. You know, some, sometimes when I get students who come to me and they, and, they, and they say, you want to play the harp? I say, well, why do you want to play the harp? I say, I just want to play the harp. And I think, I'm sure banjo teachers don't <laughs> <laughs> I've always dreamed of playing the banjo. <laughs> and it's funny, but why is it funny? Why is it funny if you want to play the banjo? And why is it like a, a lifelong burning dream to play the harp? I find this really interesting, and this is connected to the to the gender things. That who cares who plays banjo? It has no. It's just a musical instrument, but it's important who plays the harp because it's so deeply tied into these questions of cultural identity and national identity. You know, the harp gets used as the, as the national symbol in Ireland, and it get, and, it, and it does have some kind of you know it's a national instrument in Scotland, like the bagpipes. So, so these, these are really interesting questions. There's a whole thing about the harp. Not as a musical instrument, but as a cultural object. And the class act tradition in the mod is also with them nowadays, isn't it? Or is that? Yes, yeah, so, 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 so this class act tradition that was invented in the 1890s is it's mostly a women's instrument because it's musically and socially connected to the pedal harp. Like I say, the, the instruments were invented and designed by pedal harp people. So it's part of that whole world, yeah. You might get more men in the class of tradition because it's just a little bit more, I don't know, it's a little bit more diverse than the pedal harp tradition, but I don't really know. With the revival in the late 1800s and the 1900s mm -hmm. comes the revival of recordings. Yes. The earliest recordings that you have of the harp of this type being played. Of this type? Um, well, <coughs> the revival of the, the older uh, type, not so much that type, which came in from the cotton, yes. the, Ar the Irish and the Gaelic harp. Well, the, the, the yes. old Irish and Gaelic harp, like my yes, like archaeological yours. replica, the, 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 there wasn't a revival of that in the 1890s. The, the 1890s the revival was a completely new invention. Right. But how, how early on was that then recorded? So, um, Patafa Kennedy Fraser is the first person that I know of who recorded on the, on the newly invented revival class, like, and that would be, I think, 1927. Right. So, so she sings and plays the harp to accompany herself. Right. Um, I haven't found an earlier record than that, but there's a few from the 1930s. Arnold Dolmetsch in Hazelmere, he was interested in historical instruments, and so he started looking at these medieval metal stringed instruments, and his his wife, of course, because he wouldn't play it himself, he had to get a woman to play it because it was a half. So his wife made some recordings of, midi uh, of historical Irish music on this medieval style harp in 1937. But I think there were recordings on double action pedal harps really quite early. I'm not, I, 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 it's, it's, not my, it's not my main area, so I've not looked 
but I don't think they're uncommon. You get the flute and harp 2x on 78s. Yes? Are you able to tell us a little bit about the restoration or maybe that's coming? I'm not really able to because I wasn't really involved with it. It was um, my, my first picture showed it showed it before restoration. And so basically it just looks tatty and the strings are all um, but the harp was sent to Pilgrim Harps, who's a dealer and repairer and maker of pedal harps and of the modern class X, because they're basically the same thing, it's just a different size. And, um, and Pilgrim Harps dismantled the whole thing, cleaned everything. The, the, the bottom part of the harp was completely gone and had to be, I don't, I don't know how much of it is new work. I, I was under the impression that a lot of it. Um, so um, the, there was a, a, a several different types of wood that make up the instrument, and that the worms particularly like the type of wood that were in the base, which can often be the case, but also the lining within the sound box. And there was always the risk that it would be it, it had gone too far and would be too weak to actually restore it. There was always that risk, which we would have dreaded. And also, we later discovered that there's the option, the opportunity as well to think, you know, a lot of music museum, this is why the instrument at Abbotsford isn't strung, is that some, some muse museum people might think that restoring it to playing standards might not be the best route for that instrument. It didn't actually occur to us not to do that, <laughs> because um, but we probably would have considered it if, if um, Pilgrims had said that it was it, too much of it needed to be completely rebuilt. So yes, the bottom base is really carved and gilded, and there's a lining shaft inside the um, inside the sound drum that replaces the old, um, which you, you don't see. Um, but actually, we've got really a lot of the original instrument still there. It's, it's the original soundboard, isn't it? Yeah. This is the most important thing. So, yeah. um, the, the the weakest part of the harp is, is the soundboard, which is this flat panel at the front, and this is a very thin sheet of wood and it's basically unsupported, you know, it has a strengthening swelling up the middle, but it's basically attached at the sides and then there's however much tension from the strings. I don't even know how much tension there is on a half like this. A ton? Yeah, so this is going to be less, maybe half a ton. So, so half a ton of tension on a piece of wood that's maybe like four millimetres thick. So, you know, it's, it's incredibly stressed. And, and this is why it's, this is why it speaks. This is why it sounds. You know, you can you can always make the harp safe, the harp safer and less fragile by making the front thicker, and then it doesn't sound so good. So, um, so a lot of these old harps, a lot of these old harps, people people put the strings on that are too thick. And this is something that I was going to ask you about because I was interested in what choices that they made. Um, because uh, this trend to make the harps bigger and stronger, if you have an old harp, the easy way to make it louder and, and sound stronger is to put thicker strings on it. And, and that's all very well, except 10 years later, the sound board splits in half. Mm. Um, and and, and, and this, this happened with a lot of these antique <coughs> harps. And so a lot, a lot of times the, the, the harp maker will take the old sound board off and make a new one and put it on. And that's all very well, it makes the harp work, but it's not, the sound board is what produces the voice. And so, and so it's wonderful that this one has its original soundboard because then you're hearing the you're hearing the original craftsmanship of the original maker and not some modern reconstruction of it. And I think that the pedals as well, when we were talking Chad, the pedals have this amazing um, a bit, as you say, the sort of progress of the heart towards mm. the the um, uh, the heart that's the loudest. Yeah. The pedals help that sound very considerably, don't they? I think there's um, quite difficult I imagine they're quite difficult to Play, you have to move them to one side. Um, it's it's pretty much as a concert harp now. It's just I'll, I'll probably do an explanation of, of what's yeah. going on behind yeah. behind the scenes. Uh, in when I yeah, because I was thinking we should wiggle the pedals and. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's yours. I'll, I'll maybe I'll maybe explain a little bit yeah. of that. I mean, yeah. 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 No, it's actually something unusual on the on this harp as well, which is. Oh yes, the 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 back yes. Yes, you can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> but also the neck was still attached, but was did somehow just trying to... There was, there, yeah, so, so another thing that happens with these old harps is somebody bumps into it and falls over, and, and then 
and then this is the weakest point because it's very thin and so you often get splinters and damage here so th these are typical things that happen to these hearts and the heart makers are, there is a, are well used to it and it looks terrifying but <laughs> you just fix it up but, it, but you mentioned that you mentioned the ethical thing there's, there's an interesting thing with musical instruments is that an old instrument like this everybody has decided oh it should speak and so you fix it up and you get it working but actually fixing it up destroys a lot of sort of archaeological evidence. It's the same thing as a ruined castle, and you say, well, we should repair it, because people should live in it. And that's all very well, but it, in, in, by creating a new thing, you're destroying something old. And there, and there are some musical instruments that either they're too rare, or they're too damaged, that to get them working is not considered <coughs> ethically acceptable. So the, so the rare instruments, because you know, if, if this instrument had been I don't know, the first half that Sebastian Erard had ever made or something like that, then you might think, actually, we don't want to touch a bit of it. We don't want to start pulling bits of wood off and putting new ones in because but we, we want to respect... Better. But it, but it's not. You know, it's a mass-produced instrument. There's um, hundreds of them. There was a harp scholar who came from... who saw it on the, the, um, the, the crowdfunding <coughs> website and came and um, spent a whole day... Laura was very patient with him. It was a busy day and he, he was just... A, eulogising all of our heart. But he did an enormous amount of research as well to find out when it arrived in the house yes. when it was purchased. Yes. That's, that's really new information. That's very nice. That's great. Um, but he also took away some of the parts of the heart that um, that were the worm-eaten yes. parts because he wants to do lots of work on paints and sure. things. So, yeah. so I think that um, <coughs> we're fortunate that yes. there was enough here to make this still the yes. historic Yes. Well, like I say, you've got all the mechanism, you've got the soundboard, you've got the major <coughs> structure, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's good to have it working here. Yeah. And it is exciting that it works and that you can hear it. So. It was really interesting what this process was, because he was, obviously, we've got our, our number of parts, 1945, yes. um, but he was able to retrace through the workshop the different components. Yes. So he actually um, unscrewed this piece here, this tiny little section, and that's got a different number yes. in it, so that, that that's, he was able to you know, he was noting yes. down everything. Yes, because the, the factory ledger survived, so you can do this archive research and find the state of the course, yeah. The, fi the final thing I'll say about restoring a historical musical instrument is that although, although it looks messy when it's in this state, it's basically stable. And so a museum person will say, that's fine. Keep it in a climate controlled place and it won't, nothing will happen to it. Okay? Now it's restored and it's strung up to tension. It's not stable because you've got half a ton of pull on those strings. And every time the, you open the windows or whatever, the wood absorbs moisture and the strings absorb moisture and it, all, it flexes and moves. So now it's a kind of dynamic, live, living thing. And what this means is you have to get people in and playing it because otherwise it's going to deteriorate a lot faster than if you just left it untouched. So, so it's, it's really exciting and really positive thing to get it restored and working, but it's also a responsibility that now it's, now it's alive and now it has to be looked after a lot more. So it means that every year, as part of our festival, we should have some element of heart. Definitely. Or, or, or more often than that. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it really needs used and touched and played and tuned and kept an eye on it. There's already a string broken right at the way top, which is not one that's going to be used in the concert. It doesn't matter, but it should be replaced. It, it, just, it just needs constant <laughs> feeding and care and attention because it's alive. We were calling on you. The old strings were steel or silver, so and these gut. Um, the, the old strings would be gut strings. So, so this Anglo-Continental tradition of harps always use gut strings. Okay. So, so the Anglo-Continental harps have gut strings. The Irish and Scottish indigenous Gaelic harps have metal strings. This is the big divide, one of the big divides between the two traditions. So, it would have had gut strings, but um, you see, you see the shape of the harp. The, 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 the short strings are very short, and they get gradually longer and longer and longer and longer. And, and as the notes get lower, the strings get longer. And if you carried on like that, these bass strings would be hitting the ceiling. Okay, and they sound great, but that's not very really practical. So what they do is they kind of chop the top off. And the low strings are now much too short to sound good. And so they wind them with, um, with metal wire. 
Okay, so you can you can have a look. They're kind of fuzzy these lower strings because they're they're like they're loaded. So they're still gaps in the middle, but they've got a spiral around. I just noticed her going off actually. Yeah, she does want to come and spend a bit of time tuning it. Yes. So maybe if we go to go outside yes, and have we'll, a cup of we'll coffee. Leave her to it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.